This is the Permaculture Podcast. I'm Scott Mann. My guest today is Chris Gilmore. A permaculture practitioner and emergency manager, Chris works with individuals and organizations to map their community assets and help prepare for uncertain events. We recorded this conversation during the emerging COVID-19 pandemic to discuss practical solutions we can apply right now to make sense of the situation and prepare a response appropriate for our individual lives. We begin introducing the four pillars of emergency management. We then move to a six-question approach that Chris finds useful when creating our assessments. We then talk about personal actions for each of us to take in the moment, and as part of our long-term planning, using examples from Chris's own life to show the theory in practice. Throughout, we repeatedly return to what we can do to lighten the emotional load through activities that ground us in the moment, as we focus on our values, and what is bigger than ourselves as we plan for the days ahead. Enjoy this conversation with Chris. I'll join you again after and share additional resources you may find useful now and in the days and weeks to come. Then Chris, thank you for taking this time to join me. I'm particularly interested in speaking with you because of your background in both permaculture and emergency and disaster preparedness. So could you give us a bit of your biography and background, how you came to these activities, and then we can dive into what people can do to respond to and prepare for a crisis. Thanks so much for having me on. I'm really honored to be on here. I've been a big fan of the show for a long time, so this is great. So, you know, the approach I kind of take is like what I kind of call a holistic and regenerative approach to emergency and disaster preparedness. And to kind of give you context for what that means, uh, I'll maybe just give you a really, really brief kind of history of how I kind of got to that that term, this concept of holistic and regenerative emergency preparedness. So I started off as an outdoors guy and really dove into the world of permaculture and sustainability in my early 20s, you know, apprenticed on farms, went woofing, did all those kinds of things. And then I dove headfirst into wilderness survival and the study of ecology for a number of years. Because after a bunch of time on the farm, I realized that, you know, I knew how to grow things and create things. But when I walked into the forest, I really didn't understand what was going on there. And I started to realize how integral understanding ecology was to being able to even manage our farms in a, in a good way. So I dove into this world of wilderness survival and ecology for a long time. And then uh, I kind of hit this point in life, you know, in my kind of mid 30s and starting to kind of predict some really massive changes coming and really feeling like as a society and a culture, we weren't actually adapting quick enough. So I actually went back to school and started studying emergency disaster management, kind of from a a modern day top down perspective, you know, kind of like Red Cross, FEMA, government level stuff. And I I started working in that field for a couple of years as a consultant, you know, working with governments, businesses on different projects like that. But I really felt like there was a piece missing to that, particularly as it relates to, you know, bringing my gift and my passion to the world. And it was kind of that holistic approach, you know, and recognizing that you know, in modern emergency management, we have these incredible physical skill sets. We have these incredible frameworks, but sometimes it feels like we're missing some of those other components, you know, like the emotional component or the social component, or even that, what I'd call the spiritual component of it, you know, the human component of it as well. So this kind of really brought me back to my roots. And that's when I started uh, Changing World, which is kind of like a blog, it's a resource and it's consulting firm to help individuals, families, and organizations adapt in our changing times. So what I've basically been doing with Changing World is trying to kind of bridge my interesting past, you know, where I'm looking at regenerative design and permaculture and connection to nature, and then best practices in modern day disaster management, and then bridging those also, you know, with the social and the emotional components of adapting to our changing world. And uh, interesting enough, you know, I've gone back to more working with smaller organizations, and I've been working with a great uh, group off the West Coast called Our Eco Village. And we started working together about eight months ago on uh, disaster planning for their farmstead and their education center. And it's just been amazing to see now that we're in this uh, current crisis with the pandemic and COVID-19. It's really beautiful, actually, to see how quickly and effectively they're working as a team and how they're able to adapt to the situation because of this kind of groundwork we put in, kind of bridging permaculture principles and regenerative design, human culture and uh, modern day emergency management. It's a really powerful skill set, I think, for the modern world. And by West Coast, I would like to point out that you are in Canada. So that is out in British Columbia. Is that right? Yeah, they're out on Vancouver Island, British Columbia. And I'm in Ontario myself, up on the the Great Granite Shield, right on the edge of Algonquin Park. And one of the reasons why I like emergency management, as some listeners of the show know, I came to permaculture because of disaster planning. I was part of a team in the late 1990s that was preparing for Y2K. And then it was an interest in how do we get past individual 
preparedness and look at how to organize a community and create resilience that really kept bringing me back to permaculture. And it's one of the things that I like about emergency management is that the frameworks that you have within that realm relate very closely to what we can think of as like the principles of permaculture. We have these different ideas that lead us through the way that we can think about what we want to do and how we can create plans. So I was wondering if you could run us a bit through some of those ideas and how we might relate that to this work of permaculture. Yeah, certainly. So, I mean, that's kind of the way that I, I've been approaching my practice. It's not necessarily as an expert, although, you know, I'm a self-proclaimed nerd about all this stuff. So I, I do know a fair bit. But what I usually do is take these frameworks that are tried and tested and then bring them to whether it's organizations, families, individual people, and help them use it to sort through the plethora and information overwhelm that's coming at us. And, you know, people are probably feeling this a little bit right now. I, I know that's what a lot of people are telling me, that when you're in a crisis, it can be really overwhelming. And often you don't have all the information you need at those times when you actually have to make important decisions. And that can create a lot of stress and a lot of challenge. And one thing that frameworks do is they kind of give us a, a system to be able to sort through this overwhelm of information and make decisions when we don't necessarily have all the, uh, the information that we want for those systems. So it's really, really helpful to have some frameworks to guide us through these times. And I think it's interesting enough, you know, the same frameworks that are being used by emergency management bodies, I think can be uh, to the individual, to the family, to the farmstead, to the outdoor education center, to the permaculture homestead, all of those different places. Do you want to dive into a couple of them right now? Is that where you'd like to go? Yeah, that's where I'd really like to go, because then that will set up really the rest of our conversation as we can discuss those a bit more in depth, and then use them to follow up on how we can then apply those ideas into our individual lives right now. Cool. You know, I'm going to start with this one point, and I don't know if I necessarily call this a, a framework, although there is, there's definitely frameworks out there that support doing this work. But uh, I always like to actually start emergency management off with actually our personal kind of vision and our personal mission statement. You know, what do we value in life? And, you know, this idea of purpose beyond self and something that one of my mentors has said to me a lot of times is that purpose beyond self is one of the most powerful forces in the world. And the reason I bring this up in context of emergency preparedness is when we're in situations where we need to make really tough decisions, it kind of becomes our guiding star. You know, what is our purpose? It helps us actually prioritize. So I'm going to maybe come back to that a couple of times later on in the interview, but I kind of just wanted to start there. I don't know if you have any thoughts or comments on that before I dive into the first actual framework I want to go into, which is the idea of risk assessment. No, I'd like to go ahead and see where you're going to take us. So please, Chris, go ahead. So in modern emergency management, when we, let's say I approach a new client, we approach a municipality, um, any level of government, we do a risk assessment and we call it a HIRA, Hazard Identification Risk Assessment. But really what the basic idea is, is, you know, once we start thinking of all the possibilities, once we listen to the news, it's easy to get overwhelming. There's a million things coming at us. And what a risk assessment does is actually lets us be realistic about what the what the risks actually are, but then a prioritize which ones are actually most likely to impact us, which then allows us to actually set up steps and priority actions. And now instead of being paralyzed by fear because there's too many risks, we actually know which the most important ones to focus are on. And then we're able to actually take actions around those right away instead of kind of being paralyzed. I'm not gonna walk you through the HIRA right now. That's the one that we use in the modern approach, but I'm gonna maybe just share an example of how I've personally been approaching COVID-19, both with my own family and my community's preparedness, as well as some of the clients I work with in it. So what I basically did, I actually took to another framework that you're probably all very familiar with, and it's the idea of the, the six questions, you know, who, what, when, where, why, and how. So the first thing I did when I started finding out about this, I said, you know, okay, what is the actual risk? And a risk here that we're looking at is our, our primary risk is infection, and then there's going to be a million secondary risks, but we're not going to go into the secondary risks right now. That'll come up later. Uh, that's a big can of worms. But if you can imagine, you know, primary risk, infection. Okay, now how is it actually, how does an infection happen? And we, right now, you know, the leading theory, and uh, I'm calling everything a theory right now because this is a novel virus, but, you know, people are discussing respiratory droplets being one of the leading ones, and secondary would be infected surfaces. And, you know, that information could change, but that's kind of what a lot of the official sources are saying right now. Now that I know how it's being spread, I know what the risk is, then I can say, okay, well, who is it impacting? And the reality is it's impacting everybody, but it seems to be impacting the elderly more as far as, you know, the major, major impacts. So now I'm able to say, OK, I can actually establish an initial priority. My parents who are in an older life stage, one with a, a compromised immune system, I'm going to focus my priority there first. And then I'm going to shift priorities to younger, healthier people second. So there is just kind of a first couple of steps in that. 
And then the when and where questions, that kind of leads into our, our next framework, which is what we call the, the four pillars of uh, preparedness. And I wonder, you might be familiar with that from your work in the emergency management field a little bit, Scott, the four pillars. Right. Those are, if I remember right, because it's been a long time since I've been there, it's um, prevention and preparedness is kind of one, mitigation, response and recovery. Is that right? Yeah, that's the basic idea. I usually kind of clump preparedness and mitigation together. So I'd say prevention, preparedness, mitigation, response, recovery, doesn't really matter there. Where we're kind of going with this, and, and you know what, if you're hearing this for the first time, it might be a little bit confusing. But what we're actually doing is we're creating a really, really simple formula for you to follow right now. And you know that who, what, when, where, why, and how formula that I threw out there, think about that as you've got way too much information coming through. And if you listen to all of it, it's just too much to take in. So what we're going to do is just use that first framework just to establish what is the stuff that's going to impact us. And now I want to do something with it. And as soon as I've established what those things are, I can stop listening to the news for a little bit and I shift over to these next four pillars. And for prevention, what we basically are being told right now, you know, for the pandemic COVID-19 is... And I'm being very conscious not to say social distancing. I'm calling it physical distancing because I want to say that social distancing is not helpful right now. Physical distancing is. But we actually need social solidarity right now. So the prevention tools that we have are physical distancing. And then we have hygiene and sanitation are the two kind of main things being shared, right? From there, we can basically do a risk assessment with the four pillars, which kind of gives us a formula. And, you know, it's not perfect. But we already acknowledge that emergency management isn't perfect. We don't always have all the info we want. What we want is a framework and a formula that allows us to actually act. So let's go into the action steps a little bit. Okay, I've established how it spread, and I've established two prevention tools, physical distancing and hygiene and sanitation practices. Now, an action step that your readers could actually do at home, or sorry, your listeners could actually do at home right now, is basically go through what's an average day that you would go through in your life. And, you know, my wife and I run um, actually a food business, a, a wild food business, where we go and harvest stuff from the landscape and we make all these neat products. And one of the principles or one of the systems that we have to, we're required by law to put in place is this thing called HACCP. It's a hazard analyst critical control point. You don't really need to worry about the name of it. But basically what it means when we track through how we make a product, we look at all the contamination points, where they are in the making of the product. Well, there's no reason you couldn't take a, a framework like that applied to a business and apply it to your own life. So if you're a family person listening right now, you could actually just say, OK, where are the main infection points throughout my day? I have looked into how this spreads. Now I can think about, well, where would be the most likely place for me to interact with that spread? Once I've done that, I can basically apply one of those two prevention tools, physical distancing, hygiene and sanitation, or a combination of the two of them. And suddenly you actually have a somewhat simple formula for starting to approach strategies that you begin to create on that. And I can give you a really neat example of the way that uh, that I've kind of approached that. But maybe I'll just pass it back to you for a second, Scott, in case you have any thoughts or questions coming up there. Well, one question that I have as you put all this together is that you mentioned how a lot of the information that can be coming into us can change rapidly. When you're putting together a plan like this, how do you handle uncertainty or how would you recommend to people how to handle uncertainty? Because it's one of the conversations I've been having with my friends and family. Some of us are really good with uncertainty moment to moment but are not good with uncertainty long term and vice versa. And so like we know the pieces that we can work with within the theories. But generally speaking, how do you account for that kind of uncertainty when putting a plan together like this? Or is there just a way that you can create that kind of social solidarity that mitigates some of those feelings? So I'm going to maybe start by naming kind of the two elephants in emergency preparedness. And one of those is just knowing that plans aren't actually perfect when we go about these things. Actually, I'll maybe just stick to one. So I'll say there's one, there's one thing. We're just going to acknowledge that and say that out front, plans aren't perfect, but we need to take action. You know, and there's that quote that um, uh, a plan, uh, I might mix it up, but a plan executed today is better than the perfect plan executed tomorrow. And that does apply to in some situations, especially in crisis where we have to act fast. So just acknowledging that even amongst friends and family, there, there's some value to that. And I tend to think kind of in cycles. So we're, cycle one is our observation cycle. Are you familiar with the concept of the OODA loop, Scott? I don't know that that's one that I've encountered before. This is a really, really powerful framework. I won't go into the history for it, but basic idea behind it. So people, there's this, this fight flight response mechanism that a lot of us are familiar with. You know, when we come under a lot of stress or we're scared, some people tend to fight, some people freeze, some people flee, they run away, right? And what the OODA loop does is it shows that often under stress, people will observe something and then OODA stands for observe, orientate, 
decide and act. And some people will observe and then they'll just go right into an action. And that action may or may not be a good thing, you know? Um, in the case of like, we're walking through the woods and uh, we see something that makes us need to run, it might save our life. But sometimes quick actions don't actually help us. And what UDA trains us to do is we observe the initial action and then we actually train ourselves to take a breath and we orientate to what are all of our options. So we say, okay, what are all the different variables that I need to think about? And what information do I have right now? What information do I not have? Then I take another breath and then I make an action plan. And then we basically make our decision. This is what we're gonna do and we act upon that decision. And then we come back and cycle again. So I think just to be able to, you know, if you've got say, let's a group of family members or a group of workmates, and you're trying to think about how to navigate this scenario, you know, just being able to be, have a framework that you share and a common language is really valuable because you could acknowledge, okay, the plan isn't gonna be perfect. We don't have everything we need to do. Two, let's observe all of the information that we do have access to right now. And you can use that framework I just gave you, the who, what, when, where, why, how, to get the relevant information. Once you've observed that, you can orientate to what resources do we have available to us? What skills do we have available to us? Then we can take another breath and say, okay, what, are, what action plan do we have coming out of this? And now let's carry forward on that action plan, knowing that the next step is to take another breath and then observe again. And in that next observe round, we're going to take in new information and we're going to alter the plan as needed at that point. Does that kind of help you there? Are you following where I'm going with that? Yeah, I like that. And it makes me think very much about when I first started studying permaculture, when we refer to the first principle that comes from David Holmgren of observe and interact, that it was relayed to me that we should also think of it not just directly as a see and do, but a observe and then interact so that there was a pause between the two. And I can see how that kind of a breath and that pause creates a space for us to begin to make better decisions in a proactive rather than a reactive way. It's so valuable in this work, you know, and, and there is something to just kind of naming what I'm calling the elephants in the room, those things that like we're all uneasy about and that we know that aren't as ideal as we want. You know, the other tool I'll throw in there is just some really clear agreements, you know, uh, around how we're going to work together under this. And, you know, maybe even naming that, hey, we're all under stress and, you know, some of us might snap at each other from time to time and maybe not show the best conduct. And we're all just in agreement that that might happen and we're going to all do our best not to do it. And if it does happen, we're not going to have hard feelings about it. You know, we're all going to ground. We're going to take that breath and come back together and not let that hold us back from moving forward. And that, that's a really valuable thing as well. If you're okay with it, Scott, where I'd love to go is basically sharing how I kind of applied that concept of the risk assessment to my average day. If you'd like to walk us through this, it takes a lot of these ideas that are big picture kind of top down approaches to preparing for these kinds of things and makes it more accessible for our individual lives. So please do. Yeah, and that's where I'd really like to go. You know, we just got really kind of big picture theoretical, and now I'd like to really get practical with some of these steps. So you can imagine me applying this whole framework that we've just gone through up until this point. What I basically started thought, okay, what does an average day look like for me? And, you know, one of the jobs that I do for my wife's business, Wild Muskoka, is I go and do these deliveries all over. So I drive down to Toronto and Barrie and all these different towns around here and I'm dropping off stuff. And as I do that, you know, I'm going to bank machines. I have to go to gas machines. I'm entering buildings. I go to restrooms and then I go into stores. So I kind of made a list of like, okay, where are the most likely places where I could basically encounter the hows that we came up with there, which were respiratory droplets or infected surfaces. And the big ones I came up with, okay, money, exchange of money, gas, you know, the handle when I'm gas, entering uh, buildings, restrooms, and then in the syrup deliveries. And really I came up with five places where I'd be at the highest risk throughout the day. And then I thought about those other two, okay, what are our prevention measures? Well, they're distancing or hygiene. So how do I play distancing or hygiene at those different places? So money I solved really quick and just said, okay, well, you know what? I'm just not going to interact with money right now. I'm going to just use a card. And although a card still has some risk, you know, it's not being exchanged between me and the clerk. So that takes one variable out of the factor there. And then I basically started thinking, it's actually interesting. I talked with a doctor friend about this and walked him through this protocol because I started thinking, okay, doctors, they have protocols that they go through and systems for when they go into high infection environments or high risk environments, I'll say, you know. Um, when they go in to see a patient where there's any kind of infectious risk, they go through a process to go in there. And it's very systematic how they go in and how they enter and how they behave inside of that room. And, you know, the general call out to the public right now is like, wash your hands, stay away from people, don't touch your face. 
But doing those things randomly, you know, for me as an emergency management guy and a little bit of a, a self-proclaimed geek around this stuff, I'm like, that just doesn't feel enough to me to just randomly wash my hands more throughout the day. I want to be more systematic about it. So I came up with this protocol for myself kind of based on what doctors do, and I called it my left side, right side protocol. So as I, and then, you know, I'll, I'll say right off the bat, as you start this process, it might seem a little challenging, but after a few days of practice, I got really good at it. So what I basically did is I labeled my left side as my clean side and my right side, is my dirty side. And this is obviously theoretical, you know, but it's really, really helpful to train your brain, which then trains the way that you actually act in public. And so I put in my left side, I put my hand sanitizer and I put my keys, my wallet, stuff like that. I took out the one card that I was going to do all purposes, purchases with throughout the day and I put it in my right pocket and said, okay, this is my dirty side. And then as I went throughout my day, every time I got out of my car to go do a delivery or do something, I'd say, okay, I'm exiting my car right now. I'm going into a high risk environment, just like a doctor. Left hand, which is my clean side, goes into side left pocket and it stays in there the entire time I'm out if I can do that. I touch everything with my right hand. So I open doors, I pick things up, I do my groceries, everything I need to do, go in and out of the washroom, everything's with my right hand. And then every time I have an opportunity to clean my right hand, I do. But the sec basically, as soon as I leave my car, the second I touch something, I say, okay, right hand is dirty. Now, of course, my right hand could have been infected some other way. And we're getting super micro about this. But what it is, it's just creating a framework for myself to kind of make a system the same way that a doctor would going into an environment. And it's training our mind to kind of move through this new normal. So I'd go my day and then I'd say touch a door and I go and drop off a delivery inside of a store and then I come back out and then I would either take my hand sanitizer out of my left pocket, my clean side, and this way I don't even have to put my hand in my pocket to recontaminate my coat pocket and then you spray the hand sanitizer on there or I get to a washroom. And if you didn't have hand sanitizer, you know, it could be as simple as I've got a hand wash station that I set up in the back of my car. Real simple, just, you know, a little jug of water and some soap and water there. I go back to my car, I open the back door, I wash my hand. Now it's safe to use that right hand again. And now I go into my safe zone, my car. So it might sound like a lot, but do you be amazed after a few days, I've gotten really effective with doing it. And I ran it by a doctor friend and he's like, nope, that's a very logical approach to mitigating those different risk areas that you've, you've kind of come up with. Right. And I think about how we systematize those things because it then simplifies the process. It removes a lot of the thought from the ongoing action once we've kind of front loaded that decision making and created a system that we can follow in each of those moments. Yeah. And the other thing that's so important to understand here is, you know, we're, we're in an environment where a lot of people are facing real human emotions, you know, fear and stress. And it's really easy to be kind of scattered in that. So just having these as a system and actually practicing it, and it becomes body-based. It becomes something that I don't actually have to think about after a very short period of time, which then really takes a lot of stress off of my brain, which is already in a high-stress environment. So I found the mental process of this really helpful as well. And even if the system's not you know, perfect, like I'm no by no means guaranteeing that this is a perfect system, just the, the action of doing something proactive that seems somewhat logical with the information we have actually alleviates my mind a lot because I'm taking action. I'm not just doing on something. You've mentioned a couple of times about the emotional hardship of this and what we go through when we're dealing with a disaster. And I know from a lot of the planning that I went through, a lot of times it was really just about something short term that would be like an earthquake or a flood or something where you were planning for three days, a week, 10 days. When we have something that seems so long and protracted, what are some of the steps that people can go through to generally take care of their well-being? And I say that because I also think that, you know, physical security a lot of times can also help our mental and emotional state. And I'm wondering if you have suggestions for both of those sides or something that would approach it all holistically. Yeah, awesome. Beautiful question. I come back actually to the very first thing I, I mentioned when we started talking about frameworks and it's just that purpose beyond self piece being so valuable when, you know, we feel like it's just too much. And when, when we have, when we start thinking about, you know, myself, when I start thinking about my parents, when I start thinking about my sister, when I start thinking about my friend's kids, I suddenly have more energy than I thought I had to actually take action and move on things. So I, I feel like that's a really valuable thing just to, to connect with on a deep way on its own. There's a couple other ones I'll throw in there. The next one is, you know, I really think we want to be careful about how we frame the story and what words we're using. And I have a, a little bit of a personal challenge with this whole social distancing buzzword going around because social, social distancing kind of sounds like we're isolating ourselves and we're on our own. And we're very much not on our own in this, you know, 
And in fact, this is the, I would say community is more important than ever as we're going through this. So instead of saying social distancing, you know, the what, the word that I'm liking, and I actually saw this on some uh, meme on, on the internet, and I don't know where it came from, but, you know, let's use the word that we're physically distancing, but we're actually showing incredible social solidarity right now. So how do we start creating, and, you know, this is going to look for different for different people, depending on what your needs are. Maybe I'll, I'll frame it like this, the, the two tool sets that I'm using that are really valuable around per, supporting personal well-being are three tool sets. One of them is knowing who some of my closest friends are that I connect with, that that push me in good ways, that ground me, that don't tend to trigger me and bring up emotions and stuff in me that aren't healthy. Knowing who those are and actually calling them up and saying, hey, could we support each other through this? Like, could we agree to meet once in a while or to have whether it's daily check ins or every couple of days? And I basically built a small, tight circle of some of my closest friends. And I've been really picky about who are in those circles because I have lots of friends that I really care about, but not all of them actually support my mental well being in the best ways. So I've been picky to, you know, around the ones that support my mental well being. So that's step number one for me. Step number two is the connection to that greater purpose in life and actually having a personal mission mission and vision statement is really important. Step number three is for me is, is getting outside into nature, getting sunlight, getting fresh air. And you know, this one is I think huge in the processing ability. So I had a really, really crazy last week. I have a million consulting clients right now and I'm doing deliveries for my wife's business and all of this going on. And you know, after a bunch of days, I was feeling the weight of it really heavy. And I woke up in the morning and I thought, I'm sick. My lungs feel heavy. I can barely breathe. I got a little bit of a cough right now. Oh man, I've just been out in public. And I started going down that rabbit hole and I was sitting on the couch and I could feel myself getting worse thinking I was sick. And then interesting enough, you know, my wife says, oh, hey, can you go empty the compost? So I go and take the compost outside and I got lost in it. You know, I took the compost out and I'm like, oh, I better go check on the chickens. Uh, and then I ended up, you know, walking out on the creek to check something out. And I started thinking, oh, I need to prune the fruit tree soon. And after a half an hour outside, I had this moment where I'm like, oh, wow, I completely forgot that I thought I was sick. And then I'm like, here, I'm going to just take a really deep breath right now and feel my lungs. And sure enough, when I took a deep breath out in nature, I was like, my lungs are absolutely fine. You know, you were creating that because you were very tired, you know, so understanding our own psychology and how fear plays on us, developing frameworks to snap ourselves out of it. And for me, you know, going, this might look different for different people, but for me, you know, it's going out into nature is the tool that I use to snap me out of that that um, psychological rut that I can get in that tells me that I don't have the skills, I don't have the energy, I don't have enough. And ironically, going out in nature is also often what tells me, hey, you're going on overdrive right here. You think you need to do all these things, but actually, you know, you need to take a day off right now and you need to take some rest. And then that would be the number four there. So I said I was going to share two or three, but I guess there's four. The fourth one is then just acknowledging those moments and actually, you know, making sure that you sleep in once in a while, making sure that you're really nourishing yourself. I mean, my wife and I, so we took two days off coming out of that experience, I made a big pot of bone broth with, you know, a whole bunch of medicinal mushrooms and a bunch of really nourishing things and just taking two days to tend ourselves. And, you know, it's kind of funny because for those whole two days, I felt a little bit like, oh, am I sick? Am I coming down? And I was playing with that psychological game, but I came out of it being like, nope, you're feeling great and it's time to go. I'm ready to serve the community now. And I know what my purpose is. And yes, this is a long one and it's unprecedented territory, but I've got this tool set that I can now go through, which is basically those four points I just shared with you there. And that's been a piece of some of the conversations I've been recording recently is about that need for grounding activities. You know, whether that's making something with our hands, spending time outside, tending to our garden, playing with our children, just something that takes us away from all of the information that we're being bombarded with and all of these different pieces and just giving us, well, as we said earlier, that moment of pause that allows us to reassess the space that we're in. And, you know, thinking about that OODA work, loop framework when you're feeling really overwhelmed to actually say, hey, let's just take a breath right now and just observe, you know, and I like to observe out in nature myself. OK, let's orientate to everything right now. What's going on? What do I need to do? Let's take an action. And the action could be something physical or the action could be go have a nap or it could be like go for a longer walk, you know. And, you know, one other thing I'll just throw in there is, you know, another permaculture principle is uh, around self-regulate. And, you know, I think there is a lot to and it's hard to do this in crisis, but thinking about in the future, there's there's a lot to spending some time digging into your own psychology and how your brain works and what triggers you and what set, sets you off and, and developing skill sets that actually let you navigate that in tricky times, you know, and it's hard to develop those skills when you're in crisis. So I really recommend people when things are actually feeling calm. That's when you actually want to be really diving into your psychology and kind of being critical of how your brain works and when it's actually telling you stories that aren't true. And then thinking, OK, when this happens next and I'm overwhelmed, how am I going to 
it's helpful just to know that that's what your brain does and then to ask yourself, okay, how am I going to snap myself out of that, you know? And that's where each of us have these adaptive or coping methods that we can apply and finding which ones are, as you say, when you're kind of evaluating your friends and who you want to spend time with, which ones are the healthiest ones for us that allow us to stay in the moment as opposed to perhaps being some kind of an engagement that takes us away or is an escapist way to adapt to what's going on that we can choose the better, healthier path. Yeah, 100 percent. With our time left here, do you want to dive into some some kind of more action steps around this kind of current crisis? Yeah, I'd love to hear more, especially if you can relate it again to how you're living your own life as an example. Awesome. So one thing, I, I created this uh, this kind of fun course around emergency preparedness a number of years ago, and the, the first kind of module in it, I call Think Like a Survival Expert. And maybe uh, for this podcast, we'll call it Think Like a Permaculturalist for it. And basically, the idea behind the course was trying to take emergency preparedness and actually making it really simple and engaging. And, you know, one of the challenges is that people tend to not find the time for emergency preparedness until they're actually in crisis. And then suddenly the need becomes really apparent. So with the creation of this course, it's called Survive the Storms, and it's an online experience. I basically wanted to make it like fun and relevant. But the very first module is called Think Like a Survival Expert. And it's kind of based on that permaculture principle we already chatted about called Observe and Interact. And it's designed to kind of teach situational awareness and mapping hazards and resources. So something that's been really apparent to me, as because my, I've already kind of trained my mind to work like this, in the, the first early days of this, um, this incident, you know, when people first started kind of hearing about it, people started reacting out on the street, the panic started to set in. You know, people have this natural psychological tendency to want to return towards normalcy and really think about their immediate needs. But I very intuitively and instinctively go to kind of thinking a couple of steps ahead because the first few weeks of a crisis, particularly this kind of crisis, often in some ways are it's more about the emotional stuff that comes up than it is the actual physical stuff. You know, a lot of people could just stay home for a week and they have enough food in their house already. Even if you don't, you know, a lot of people that are healthy, if you don't have a medical condition, you can just not eat for a week and just you'd probably be alive at the end of it and, and be OK, you know. But we tend to just like grasp for normalcy. We want food. We want toilet paper. We want to cling to all these things that are normal. And where I'm going with this in the think like a survival expert. So I'm, I'm sitting there downtown and I'm basically watching the lineups. You know, they're everyone's at Walmart. Everybody's at the major box stores buying stuff. And this is basically when it came out that there was no hand sanitizer and there was no alcohol left. And people are really starting to panic because they can't get hold of these things. Now, I didn't actually need these. My wife's a herbalist. So we make a lot of these things ourselves and we're well stocked up just because we just live that way. But I started thinking, OK, if I was to think like a survival expert right now and be really instinctive about this, I don't want to go where the herd mentality is taking me into all those places. So I started thinking, OK, where are people not going right now? And I'm like, OK, there's all these tiny little ma and pop variety stores that are kind of like on the side streets or, you know, just outside of the main commercial areas. Or if you live in the country, you know, the one that's outside of town. So I started going around to all those places. And sure enough, you know, you could find alcohol and hand sanitizer at all of them before. And those places are empty because everybody is just going to the normal places. You know, they're going to the Walmarts and stuff like that. My dad actually shared a great one with me the other day. So he's sitting in the grocery store and he's realizing that everyone's panicking because there's no bread. He has this thought in his head. He's like, oh, wow, well, you know what? I've got this bread maker that I used to make bread with all the time. And uh, I used to really love doing that. And I kind of forgot. I'm going to walk over to the flour section. I hope it's not all gone. And he walks over there and sure enough, he said, there's not a single bag of flour missing, yet all of the canned food has gone and all of all of the bread is actually gone and people are panicking. And nobody's realizing that they can actually just make bread themselves. They don't have to make bought bread. And if you think about it, you know, if I go and buy a loaf of bread for five bucks, it's going to last me a couple of days. For five bucks, I could buy a big bag of flour that's now going to make bread for the next couple of weeks for me for the exact same price, you know. So thinking like a survival expert is starting to just kind of uh, consider things in different ways. And when we think about shelter, water, fire, food, and not necessarily just rushing around with the herd mentality, it's again, the OODA loop, you know, we observe, okay, everybody's rushing to Walmart. Well, where aren't they rushing right now? And what do I actually need right now? Orientate to that and orientate to my other options that might be available and then make a decision and act upon it. And then on top of that, it's maybe thinking ahead a couple of steps and being like, okay, am I actually reacting emotionally right now? And I'm I'm buying an incredible amount of toilet paper when really I should be in the flower section, you know, because that flower might run out eventually as well. But if I went to the flower first, I'm actually way more set up than if I just went and bought a, a loaf of bread. Well, and you remind me about the being able to buy flour and make bread about, you know, we have that conversation about building resiliency and, you know, the transition town movement in particular comes to mind about reskilling. And it's one of those things as I'm sitting here in my mm -hmm. home for 
what is now the third day without leaving. And I have a, a couple more before I am likely to be able to again. And just thinking about all the things that I can do here around the home to take care of myself without ever having to leave because I was fortunate enough to be taught how to wash laundry by hand without a machine, how to cook, how to make basic repairs and things like that. And how when we're out of a crisis like this, that those are some of the conversations that we probably want to be having and sharing how to do those things again. And that by doing that, the way that we can help build some community around those actions together. That's a lot of the work I've actually been doing with our eco village out west is um, actually helping them do community asset mapping, where outside of crisis time, they're basically looking at all of the specialties and skill sets that they have in those communities. And they're making agreements ahead of time about how they would actually share those skill sets with each other in an actual crisis mode. So it's, it's pretty beautiful to see that. But it, that does take a little bit of uh, pre-work. You know, some of the other innovative ones, just to throw out a couple other ideas. So, you know, alcohol and hand sanitizer out right now. And even soap starting to run out, you know, but who's thinking about the local soap person at your your market, you know, even in the city, you know, I go down to the big markets in Toronto from time to time and every market in Toronto has someone that's selling soap. That person might have a plethora of soap, even though the Walmart is out of soap right now. Hand sanitizer, you know, where is the local distillery, that micro brew or, you know, the local distiller that's making that micro alcohol product? And we've actually realized or, or found that a couple of the distilleries around here have actually been offering to make high test alcohol and provide it to businesses and even hospitals to make hand sanitizer and to make uh, cleaning solutions. Right. So there, here's a place where, you know, that, that local small scale company is actually able to serve a really important role. But most people would never even think of that. You know, oh, it's not on the shelf. It's gone. And this is actually an opportunity because, you know, that distillery, they might not be selling a lot. Well, maybe they are selling a lot of alcohol, but the, the LC, LCBO and our, our liquor stores are closing down right now. Traditionally, you know, those businesses might actually be really struggling right now because they're shutting down the soap lady at the market. Oh, my goodness. She doesn't have a market to sell it anymore. She's struggling. But if we actually started looking at them in resources, one, we'd be finding things we're not finding in the Walmart. And two, we're actually supporting a small entrepreneur that might not be supported otherwise or that might be going into harder financial times. So it really is a win win when it comes to an all around sustainable and regenerative kind of community model, you know. And just as an interesting aside, as your LCVO and other places are shutting down Tonight, as we're recording this, Pennsylvania is shutting down all non-essential businesses. And my friends and I were reading through the list to see what would remain open. And our liquor stores and beer distributors are on the list of essential businesses. Well, for those of you listening, if you didn't get in on the hand sanitizer craze, then uh, maybe your next step is the, the liquor store. Not to drink, <laughs> but for sanitation. <laughs> Chris, I've really enjoyed this time with you. And as always, it, the time always seems to go so quickly. And I feel like there's a lot more that we could dive into. And I'd certainly like to have another conversation once things are a bit calmer so that we can talk about asset mapping and some more of the top-down planning. But in the few minutes that we have remaining, is there anything else that you'd like to share with the listeners? I'd like to maybe share two things uh, or kind of two areas of thought. One of them, you know, one of the things we were talked about chatting about was uh, finances and food. We're not going to have time to get into that, but I'd, I'd like to just really encourage people to think really creatively. You know, in nature, you have a forest and a forest has its kind of habitat and its niches within it. And if you can imagine an old growth forest has a forest fire come through, well, the forest fire is kind of like the pandemic. And when the forest fire comes through and wipes everything out, it doesn't just destroy all life. It basically shifts from one type of habitat to another habitat. And this new habitat will have new niches. So I would encourage people that are really worried about financial hardship right now to think about what new niches have just been exposed into this. And, you know, a really simple framework for thinking about making money is what problems exist right now, what new problems are created in this disaster, and what skill sets do I have? And if you can connect the skill set with a problem, then you potentially have a way to bring in new income that you didn't really realize was there to begin with. So I'll leave people with that as just a real condensed version on the financial piece. And then on the, the food piece, there's a million things I'd like to chat about that. But one thing that I think is really helpful that people can do right off the bat to get nutrient dense food that grows quickly. And that's the thing, you know, gardens are going to be coming up in a couple of months. Maybe they are already. But um, if you're thinking about food fast, sprouting seeds are a great thing that you could be getting going right now in your home. You can do it in the city and you can grow quite a plethora of it. So I would think about, you know, things like sprouting, even growing indoor mushrooms are things that can actually produce food really quickly. And you can order those things online. So there's a thought on food. And then the very last kind of closing thought that I'd like to share is just that I really think we need to reframe our 
our story around disasters. The whole idea behind my business, Changing World, changingworldproject.com is my website. The whole idea is that the world is changing quick, but the world's actually always been in a state of change. Crises have always existed. And we've happened to go through, depending on where you live in the world, at least where I live here in Canada, we've gone through a relatively stable chunk of human history right now. And it's allowed us to get really complacent. But if we reframe the story that crisis has always existed and that humans have actually stepped up and rose to the challenge and adapted and thrived throughout time, that's just a way more empowering story for me. You know, so to start thinking about, you know, what what are we actually capable of in these times? Let's call out to our best selves to actually step up to the challenge and know that we're actually built for challenging situations and we face challenges every day of our life. So maybe I'll just leave those as some kind of positive closing notes for everybody. Well, thank you for that and everything else you shared, Chris, and for joining me today. I've really enjoyed it. Awesome. Thanks, Scott. I really, uh, I really appreciate you having me on here. And that was Chris Gilmore. You can find out more about him and his work, Changing World, at changingworldproject.com. He also put together a resource page at changingworldproject.com slash permaculturepodcast, where you'll find more information mentioned during this interview, curated by Chris. You can also check out the eco-village he is working with on disaster preparedness, Our Eco-Village, at ourecovillage.org. As Chris and I return to the idea of our purpose beyond self several times during this interview, I want to come back to this in my closing remarks with two books to recommend. The first is Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. Of all the books I've read in my life, this one slim volume, something most of us can read in a few hours, has had the most impact on my inner life and understanding how meaning can protect us and help us through the hardest moments. The second is Robert Wright's Why Buddhism is True. In this book, Robert looks at the modern research that shows how we can see ourselves and the world more clearly through mindfulness practices that lead to greater truth and happiness. I find the insights of this book and the different ways to be mindful, beyond just meditation, relate well to the discussion today, and in the interviews with Robin Mello and Natalie Bogwalker about finding our grounding activities. Finally, as I said at the end of that recent interview with Robin, I don't know what the future holds, or how hard it will be, but we will get through this together. If I can help in any way, get in touch. Email show at the permaculture podcast.com or write the permaculture podcast, P.O. Box 16, Dauphin, Pennsylvania, 17018. Until the next time, observe and interact, plan, and take small and slow solutions while you care for Earth, yourself, and each other. Each other. Each other. Each other. Each other.